No joke. Jerry swept the floor of the hallway while the guards looked on. This used to be Mr. Henderson's job, but then his poop started glowing, and now he was in cell 14 with, with Mr. Ahim. The guards would have had to do it, but they had him do it instead in exchange for paper and pencils. Good morning, Jerry! Screaming man screamed. Good morning, Mr. Stewart. Jerry said. I hope you have a good day today. The screaming man returned to screaming wordlessly. He could never stop screaming, though it didn't seem to matter much what he screamed. No one had gotten much sleep when he first arrived. Jerry was glad it was cleaning day. There were no tests on cleaning days. As he passed by cell 8, the man in black and white stripes reached through the bars and held out a cookie for his lunch. Jerry took it gratefully, and a man gave him a thumbs up. He couldn't talk, but he was still one of Jerry's best friends. He carefully swept around the edges of the devil's circle. The thing inside the circle hurt Jerry's eyes to look at it. It sometimes whispered things, but Jerry was never able to quite understand it. He was glad for that. The others said it made the most terrible promises. Finally, he was near the end of the hallway. You. Boy. A pair of haunted eyes stared from over a long broken nose. Sir? Jerry said politely. He had always tried to be nice to other st uh, subjects. He didn't have any other friends. Send for help. Uh, Chicanerous gangster conspiracy. The Dracula men from Venus are at a constant threat. We must and must be warned. I tr I tried, Mr. DeCray, Jerry said. I tried calling the police. They all left. And I got put in the timeout box, and that's when the peep the phone in the guard's break room was removed. Not the police. This is too big. Chicanerous gangster conspiracy fascist. Call five five seven two seven seven five sixty. Press five and say Bixby actually actual to save the world. Bixby actual. I don't have a phone. Jerry said. He wished Mr. DeCray would stop shouting. It was better when things were quiet, or as quiet as they could be with a screaming man. People didn't get angry. Sometimes they wouldn't even take anyone upstairs for a while. Then you need to find one. A phone. 55-727-7560. Five, five and bips be actual. The man tried to grab at Jerry was just a few inches too far. I remember. Jerry said, making a few more steps back. It was better to humor him. He couldn't get out, but he could yell. And one man screaming was enough. Besides, it wasn't Mr. DeCray's fault. He was like that. I'm not crazy. 555-727-7560. 555. The man's voice cut off to a sputter as a spray of water hit him in the face. That's enough. One of the guards said, putting down the hose. Don't make me put you in the box. The man gibbered a bit, and then, but then choked off the words and huddled back in the cell. Jerry felt bad for him. He had been almost normal when the guards first brought him in, but after a few sessions with, with Mr. Greenberg, this was one of his better days. Jerry finished the sweeping, and one of the guards took the broom. As Jerry walked back to his own cell, he heard a defiant voice whisper. Seven, seven, five, sixty. Five and fifty actual. Jerry sat down on his bunk bed. He had a bottom bunk. Duncan had the top bunk. Duncan was sometimes a cat, but was currently a man. As the gang... He asked. They're fine. 
Jerry said. Mr. Quiet gave me a cookie. Miss Quiet gave me a cookie. He's good, people, Duncan said. Do you have any problems for me? Jerry asked. <laughs> Get out the paper, Duncan said. Jerry pulled out some sheets and a pencil from under the bed. Fifty-one times fourteen, seven fourteen divided by six, and the square root of eleven fifty-six. There was a shifting, and then Duncan was a cat, jumping down to watch Jerry. These were hard, but they passed the time. The door opened, and a tall, burly man looked in. He grimaced, showing off triangular, shark-like teeth. It was Rodriguez, the head of security. Break room. Now. He growled. Jerry quickly got to his feet. Duncan would make sure the papers were put away. He didn't want to make Mr. Rodriguez mad. Though, Mr. Rodriguez was usually mad anyway. He followed the guard to the break room. Someone had spilled a pot of coffee. Jerry went and grabbed the mop and bucket. He began working. Fuck. Rodriguez said, I'm needed in the office. This better be cleaned up by the time I get back, you little shit. It didn't take long as Jerry's put it just Jerry put the mop and bucket away. He noticed someone that had left their phone on the table. He hesitated for a moment, then picked it up and dialed the number Mr. DeCray had said. <coughs> Sal's come down and pizzas. Said a man on the other end. This is Sal. Jerry's heart sank. Mr. DeCray was crazy after all. Hello? Sal asked. Anybody there? Jerry decided he wanted to be able to, to at least tell Mr. DeCray he'd done what he had asked. It might make him happy. So he pressed five and ants and whispered, Bits. Bixby Actual. He closed the f phone and was putting it back when a hand grabbed him by the collar and slammed him into the table. Who did you call, you little fucker? Who did, did you call? Rodriguez squeezed his arm so hard that tears started to fall down Jerry's cheeks. Uh, nobody, Jerry said, trying to keep on his feet as his arms were wrenched around. I was just... Don't lie to me. You want to be put in a box? You want that? Rodriguez picked up the phone with his other hand and pressed some buttons before listening. He closed it again. You are trying to order a fucking pizza? He asked, contempt heavy in his voice. You little shit. Get back to your cell. Jerry was lifted to his feet and shoved back into the hallway. He ran back to the cell. He made a tent from his blanket and Duncan sat down and told him stories until he felt better. We've, we've got a call. It's a front known to the Cray, but we're 90% sure, sure it wasn't the Cray on the other end of the line. Trace it. It was testing day and Jerry was pulled roughly from his cell. He didn't struggle, never made anything better. Rodriguez hauled him up the stairs and to Mr. Greenberg's laboratory. There was glassware everywhere, though Jerry had never seen Mr. Greenberg do anything with it. The Punson burner had seen some use, though. Mr. Rodriguez. Mr. Greenberg sat at his desk, wearing his lab coat, stroking his greasy brown goatee. You're a little late. You know, had a minute's to st stir, I put in punctuation, and yet you cannot rub two neutrons together in your head to make it on time. Sorry, Dr. Greenberg. Rodriguez said his eyes had a glassy look most people had when they talked to Mr. Greenberg. Jerry wondered about that sometimes. Everyone else, even the other test subjects, had trouble saying 
anything against Mr. Greenberg. Or doing things he didn't want to. They weren't scared to. They just couldn't. It didn't work on Jerry. You wonder if it was because he just didn't know better. You don't need to to mention my simple relation but right now. Greenberg continue. The Greenberg and Admiral Gloop is a forefront of humor and endeavor. And you can keep a simple tank table. I sometimes wonder why I pulled you back from the circle. Rodrigo's fingers tense. He always got nervous if you mentioned the devil. Jerry got nervous when Mr. Rodriguez got never got nervous. The guard had a tendency to take it out on anyone who's smaller than him. Now, dash five. What is to be done with you? Speak up now. Uh, nothing, sir. Jerry said he just wanted to be back in the cell. But he knew that they wouldn't let him. Not until he'd done something to him. Some sort of test. Hopefully it'll be quick. Sometimes it's hardly took any time at all. And he could leave. Though that almost made it worse. Because he never knew how long it was going to take. It was a terrible thing to have hope sometimes. Nothing. You must do something. Do you not realize that you are a threat to humanity? A danger to the very reality of nature. You must be studied. You must learn. You must learn your secrets. You are an enig enigma. A lively safely. Jerry didn't say anything. He just looked down at the floor and waited for Mr. Greenberg to decide what to do with him today. Now let's start with a simple test. Let's test your genital properties. Shall we? Mr. Greenberg pulled out a scalpel. Hold his iron man up, Mr. Rodriguez. Jerry struggled in a heavy set man's grip, but he was no match for the adult. Now a simple incision, like so. Knife bit down into Jerry's arm, opening another cut. Now over the watch. Jerry bit down on his lip as he watched the blood flowing down his arm. He focused on the bowl they used to catch it. He, was, he hoped this was all they did to him. It hurt, but that's all it did. Sir, how long are we going to keep doing this? Rodriguez asked. You've been at this for years. He'll bleed and then he'll have a cut, just like all the other times. It wasn't. Jerry felt sure that Rodriguez cared about the pain, but the guard constantly complained about having to hold test subjects up and down the stairs. Mr. Rodriguez, are you critiquing my technique? Perhaps you would like to have another play date with the Class 4 Devabellic Entity. Mr. Greenbird's eyes glowed. They did that sometimes when he got upset. No, no, Dr. Greenberg. I'll be good. Jerry could see the guard's face, but he took a quiet satisfaction in his fear. Rodriguez ner nervous was cruel, but Rodriguez scared was too busy cringing to lash out. He probably wouldn't ask again for weeks. Now that it appears that nothing is happening, but when we wipe away the blood, we find that nothing is happening. Why are you frustrating my efforts, Dash 5? No, you're anonymous, but you refuse to cooperate. I'm, I'm sorry, Jerry said. He wished he could have done, do something that Mr. Greenberg wanted. Then maybe he'd stop hurting him and just leave him in the cell. The others got tested hardly at all. Not slowly enough. Next test, we shall determine how the subject responds to stimulated or spur I see arrest via drowning. The sword triggers get him strapped in the gurney and I'm in all ready to hose. Then we can proceed with some kind of test. Tears streamed down Jerry's face, but he didn't protest. He knew from hard experience it wouldn't help. Iris felt like sinking down as low as her chair as possible. She didn't feel ready, but after two months of training, Adams had given her the thumbs up, and it was good enough for the council. Back in the old days, she could just shrink back, let others get the details down, and do whatever they told her. 
Now she was supposed to run the mission personally. She sat up a little straighter and tried to look professional. An intelligence agent stood up at the front of the room, a clicker in their hand, as they flashed through PowerPoint slides. The building is three stories. Greenberg lives at the top floor, and his people live in the other two. We believe that Dr. DeCray is being held underground, along with the other, along with the one who made the call. What do you know about the call? Asked Dr. Delight, but Dr. Light. We believe it was a child. Teens at the oldest, younger if it was male. They're not enough to tell anything else. Do we have a layout for the bed? Asked one of the agents. Blueprints would have been filed, surely. When Greenberg was acquiring the property, it was one story tall. A farmhouse. There are no records of it being expanded or renovated. We believe it was altered by Greenberg's abilities. So we have no idea what's down there. Light said flatly. That's correct, ma'am. We could try se seismic readings, but frankly, that was has a good chance of tipping them off. Besides, we don't even know if this is a creation or an active manifestation. What? Iris asked. She immediately flushed as people turned to look at her. That is, can you explain the difference, please? The intel agent nodded. An intel agent nodded. Sorry, ma'am. Jargon. A creation isn't real. Arrangement of matter. Think of it like a hole. The type grain just moves dirt out of the way and there's a hole. They don't need anything to do more with it. And when you stop working with it, there's still a hole. In an active manifestation? An active manifestation would be more like they don't actually move any dirt. They just protect new space where they want the hole. It lasts as long as they keep working on it. If you dug it from the other side where it should be, you go right through it without ever encountering the hole. Oh, she said, her eyebrows furrowed. Sounds like, like a lot more work. Why don't they just do creations? Some don't know they can. The agent was comfortable with the question, as though it came up a lot. Others find it easier to make changes to a manifestation rather than going through creation each time. A thought occurred to her. What happens to the hole if the bender dies? The intel agent winced. If it's a creation, nothing. If it's an active manifestation, don't be in the hole. When that happens, you'll end up standing next to the hole. You could end up buried where the hole should have been, or you can end up nowhere at all. That could be a that could be a problem. Going to have to go through into the hole to find Greenberg said one of the agents. He leaves the grounds once a week to realize with local governmental authorities, which consists of a closed-door conference with the mayor and members of the city council, followed by a meeting with their local chemist. Your OP will take place while he's out. We will shut down cell and phone service on the grounds while you go in and take the property, moving all persons and items of interest from the property. You will confront Greenberg as he returns. Makes sense, Iris said. She was glad that they'd be tackling Greenberg separately from his guards and prisoners. It made the job seem more manageable. How will we get there? You go over the fence. They have guard towers, but they don't seem to have enough personnel to actually keep them manned. We don't anticipate strong resistance, but keep your guard up. There are more details, conferences, Tendencies, but in the end, Intel's plan was fairly solid. The day before the OP, Iris felt like she was going to throw up. She'd done things like this before, but she, she'd never been in charge. It always been someone else, sometimes him, sometimes their handler. But now she was the one who was gonna make, going to be making the calls. Nervous? Adams asked. She was wearing the suit again. Although she pulled out some of the glowing light bits and put her matte coating over the previous semi-gloss surface, neither modification seemed to affect the suit's performance at all. Does it show? Iris asked. 
a little better look at you. Adams smiled. Relax, it's a milk run. Greenberg shows all the signs of low level Bixby. Intel has the op planned out from the start to finish, and despite what you've heard, the plan usually survives until the until at le least second or third contact with the enemy, sometimes fourth. Funny, Iris said. She knew all the plans. You'll be fine, sis. I'll be on standby if things go wrong. Your teams know what you're doing. And ask yourself this. Is there any chance this will be worse than... No. Iris said, and she realized Adams was right. No matter what happened, it wasn't the worst thing that had already happened. Adams nodded. You got this, kiddo. She said. Go get some ass. She gave Iris a pat on the shoulder, then picked up her rifle and jogged off to the armory. Jerry watched warily as Mr. Greenberg... Greenberg walked through the door into the subject's hallway. He had to stand on a chair to see through the bars, but he hated not knowing what was going on. It was supposed to be a no-testing night. Mr. Lightriggers, I'm going to discuss the matter of our funding with the local constabulation. Let's make sure the area is concerned, Mr. Kyad. He glanced around the hallway and sniffed, El Klein. Jerry relaxed. He wouldn't be going upstairs. Yes, Dr. Greenberg. The guard looked pointedly at Jerry. Oh, instead of consistency of the gods to sweep the perimeter, it'll give them something to do. That night, Iris found herself huddled about a mile from Greenberg's facility with 32 of her new closest friends. Ma'am, we have confirmed that, that Greenberg has left the perimeter, said Jang. He was her second in command. He had been in fields off for t over ten years, had a flawless record. He was frankly a babysitter. He made it clear that he wasn't going to take over unless things w went very wrong. But he would let her know if she was screwing up. He reminded her of Agent Lopez. She missed Agent Lopez. He always made her feel safe. Thank you, Jang, she said. We will hold off, hold off for half an hour and then move. He nodded. Any words first? She took a deep breath and nodded. If she was going to be in charge, she needed to act like it. Jang motioned for everyone to gather close. All right, everyone. Oh, all right, everyone. You know what we're here to do. Take one room at a time. Most of the guards are above ground. So we clear those first, then we take the lower part. She looked them over. They were wearing body armor, most of them carrying assault rifles. A few had other equipment, like axes, crowbars, and portable ram, with skeleton key painted on it. They had all turned to look at her. Some of them seemed to be listening intently. Some didn't seem to take her entirely seriously. You all know who I am. Maybe you don't think I should be here, but at the moment, I am running this up. If any of you don't like that, you should have requested a reassignment. Any questions? Sounds good, ass. Said one of the agents. She recognized him. Jackson. He had been a part of her security de detail a few years prior. Jane coughed meaningfully, and Iris fixed the young agent with a cold, hard stare. Er, that is Agent Thompson, ma'am. He looked about ready to crawl down inside his PPE. All right. All right, people, sit tight. We move in 25 mics, Chang said. They didn't bother hopping the fence. A pair of bolt cutters had a hole opened up in under a minute. Then everyone was pushing through. The point man put his fingers up and everyone crouched down in the bushes. Someone was approaching. Several someone's having a discussion. Think it's gonna rain? First voice asked. I hope not. Hell of a night if, for patrol if it does, said a second. Well, it's not like the rain's gonna wait for the more convenient than that, first voice said. I don't think it would. I'm just saying it would be a shame, though. A real shame is that we got picked, said a third. Out of everyone in, why us? 
I don't know about you, but I think Rodriguez has it in for me ever since I was watching that shark show, said a first voice. I think he's ever since it personally. Not everything's about him. Try telling him that. It ain't thinks that. Second voice stopped. Did you hear something? I was held a photo out and waited for it to finish developing. The guards were just turning towards her when the first one tripped. The second felt a tap on his shoulder. Then the third found sat falling down over his face. The MTF members had them bagged up before they understood they were under attack. Snapping the shutter felt right. Reaching through the Polaroids felt right. Every time she used her power, she felt like herself again. Ironic, she thought that the thing that made her feel the most like Iris Thompson was the right thing. She got her named SCP-105. Five agents hung back to keep watch while the rest moved forward towards the side door. Team breached the door like clockwork. They'd done this similar times, all sorts of compounds. This was nothing new. Even Iris had done this a few times, though. In a previous experience, it mostly meant cleaning up after Abel tore through the opposition. They were in. She moved in with the rest. Camera ready. The first two in already had a prisoner. A skinny man in a gray and black security uniform. His hat. He realized had the emblem of SCB Foundation on it but with the points of the arrows placed by two capitals, G's, and an A. She mentioned for the rest and keep moving forward. The rest of her team streamed in behind. There were two casualties as they cleared the rest of the ground floor. Both of them guards. The rest were tied up and bagged for later removal. The second floor was mostly asleep. There were no problems capturing the personnel there. The third floor contained several spacious rooms. Most of them with expensive furniture and random pieces of art. There were also a fake-looking laboratory that looked like it had been made for a movie set. There didn't seem to be much of actual scientific equipment. Finally, there was a large door. Break it down. Several of her men took the ram and pounded on the door. It ended up taking three tries to break it down. Inside there were filing cabinets and kittens. What the hell? One of the agents crouched down for a closer look. Something wrong with them faintly mewing kittens. They were bloated, and their fur was patchy with open sores in places. Careful, Jane said. As the agent reached out, touched the kitten, it suddenly doubled inside, and then exploded with a loud bang, knocking the woman back. Shit! Jane grabbed the wounded agent by the back of her collar and pulled her out of the room. Fall back, Iris said. As they moved, she took a picture of the doorway. As soon as it developed, started flicking at the living bombs through the photo. That made them far enough away to avoid any more injuries. How is she? She asked Jane. We got the blade on the controls, he said. But I'm not sure she'll keep the, keep the arm. She felt a twinge in her stomach. She had lost teammates before, but now she was in charge. The agent had been under her command. It was her responsibility to keep them all safe as possible. Fuck those things, one of the agents said, sp spitting towards the smoking remains of all the kittens. Keep moving, but carefully, she said. It was also her responsibility to get the job done. She steeled herself. They were d there despite the wrist. She could get them killed just as easily by not doing her job. And it took it slowly once they entered the room. But there didn't seem to be any explosive kitties, kittens left. Montoya, start going through those files, Iris said. See if you can get Cliffsnow's version of what's in the basement. Yes, ma'am. Be quick, we're going down as soon as we have the floor secure. There was something wrong. There was shouting and shooting upstairs, and Jerry wondered exactly what was going up on up there. The guard, Mr. Bubsy, kept at the door. Don't pay any attention, he said. Just keep sweeping the guards upstairs, having all covered. That was when Rodriguez came down. We're compromised, he said. It's time to liquidate the assets. Liquidate? Kill them, shithead. We can't let anyone else take them. Dr. Greenberg is not going to want to see his investment in someone else's hands. 
Just as to Jerry, start with that one. Jerry's mouth had dropped. The mop fell from his hands. What? Come on, Micah. It's just a kid. If you're too much of a pussy, I'll do it. Rodriguez pulled out his gun, and Jerry looked around desperately for someone, someplace to hide. Bubsy punched Mr. Rodriguez in his mouth. A few sharp teeth went flying. Run, kid! He shouted. Sir Rodriguez shot Bubsy in the stomach and was leveling the gun at Jerry when something foul smelling and brightly glowing hit him in the face. What the fuck? He shouted, trying to wipe it off his eyes. Mr. Quiet was throwing, made a throwing motion. And his wall rope snagged Mr. Rodriguez's arm, making the gun fall to the floor. Jerry tried to grab it, but he accidentally kicked it down the hallway, past the devil's circle. He began running after it. Rodriguez bit at the air, and Mr. Quiet fell back as the cord snapped. The burly guard began running after Jerry. You're fucking dead, you freaks. Start with that brat. Jerry was running as fast as he could, but Mr. Rodriguez's regs were much longer than his. He started to skirt around the side of the circle. Then he realized Mr. Rodriguez was just behind him. There are other choices. He jumped through the glowing circle. There was a sensation of something trying to grab him, but somehow slipping past him. He fell out the other side and rolling to his knees. He heard a scream and looked behind. Mr. Rodriguez was halfway through, and he hadn't escaped the grasp of whatever was in there. His body began to grow longer. His mouth was a grimace. It kept getting bigger until his jaws were stretching this searching the size of his face unnaturally wide. His skin was turning gray and his clothes were tearing. His arms shrank, shrank and flattened until he became fins. And a tail began to grow from, from his rear. In moments, a ten-foot shark was thrashing on the floor. The last thing to change were his eyes, going from brown to pure black. The pink fading from them, the things struggled within the circle, trying to find water until it finally stopped, exhausted, its gills gasping. Jerry sat there, panting for a few minutes longer. Then he carefully made his way past the other side of the circle until he reached Mr. Bubsy. The man was still alive, if hurt badly. Fuck! He said, he shot me. Why did he do that? He reached, Jerry reached in Bubsy's pocket and pulled out his keys. Goffer Guard offered no resistance. He was about to start unlocking the cells when he heard the door to the stairs kick open. Suddenly, men with guns came streaming down. He stood up and grabbed the only weapon and reached his mop. Found something, ma'am, Antoya said, handing her, her a file. A file simply had a minus five at the top. A quick glance showed it was about a young boy. Arcala. She guessed. The report was thick with pages pages of revisions. She wondered how long Rainberg had been holding him. There are a few pictures. He looked so scared. We're about to re reach the basement, said Jing. Great. Let's do it, Iris said. She followed him down the stairs back to the first floor. The British team was ready, and on her signal, they proceeded down the stairwell and broke through the door. On the other side, they found themselves confronted by a short, skinny little boy holding a mop, standing over a guard bleeding out from a gunshot. Behind them was a a shark in some kind of glowing circle. There were doors along the hallway, and faces could have been seen looking through little barred windows at, at them. Don't, d don't hurt my friends, little boy said. He was obviously terrified, but nor was he making any move to back down despite his shaking knees. Iris recognized him from the file. We're not here to hurt you, Iris said. We're just looking for our friend. Th then why do you have guys have guns? He asked her. Jang looked at her for orders. Even a ten-year-old could be dangerous, depending on his abilities. Instead of answering directly, Iris opened the file again and glanced through it. Such refuses to reveal anomalous abilities. Proposing further experimentation. What kind of test? Exposed to open flame, aggressive dogs, loads of lit 
mid-level interrogations. Iris looked back at the little boy standing between her and the other prisoners. There weren't many scars, not that showed anyway. She walked forward and knelt down and pulled the mop aside. Putting her hand on his shoulder, she said, It's okay. We're not going to let them let them hurt you anymore. The little boy looked at her sullenly. You promise? I promise, she said. Then you, and you have to help my friends too, he said. We'll do our best. She said she wished she could promise him more, but it all depended on what the Foundation decided. She was still sure, though, that they would be better off with the Foundation than with Greenberg. She turned back to her team. Agent Jang, please inform the director we won't be able to bring Greenberg in alive. We're, we've determined he's too dangerous. Yes, ma'am. The agent said grimly. I can help you. She felt the voice as much as she heard it. It reverberated it inside of her head. Greenberg? She asked wearily. I am not Greenberg. The voice was almost painful. I help people. She realized the voice came from a glowing circle. She could almost see something in there, but she couldn't tell quite what. It was watching her, though. What kind of help? She asked. Joseph Greenberg wanted to contain me. I told him how. I could be kept. Here I am. She realized suddenly that this, that it was sending whole concepts to her directly. Her own brain was translating it into words. She realized that what it meant to buy contain and kept... We're not quite the same thing. Why is why is there a shark there? He asked. She asked Stalin. He wanted to be stronger. I made him stronger. He is at the top of the food chain. He's dying, she said. She felt pity for it. She wondered who who it had been before it had been transformed. He will not die. He would not be strong if he were dead. I keep him alive in the circle. Miss, said one of the prisoners, a twenty-something black man. It can't do anything to you if you don't let it. Don't pay it any mind and stay out of the circle. It seemed like good advice. Everyone keep clear of that. Whatever it is, get all c civilians and anything that looks important out of here. I think we've got what we came for. Of course, that left the harder task for the night. As they exited the compound, the little boy looked around, bewildered. Jang frowned and started to say something, but Iris mentioned for him to be quiet. Those are stars, Jerry, she said. There's so many, he said. How can it be so many of anything? Keep looking, she said. Whatever happened to him, whatever happened to him, she wanted him to have a chance to see it now. Ma'am, Jang said. We have Professor DeCray. He's a bit addled, but he seems to be doing better now that he's out of the cell. He gets better when he, when he hasn't seen Mr. Greenberg for a while, the little boy said. Thank you, Jerry. It was sad. She thought that he referred to such things so casually. Helicopters were arriving to take prisoners back to the Foundation site for a debrief study and hopefully, at least for some of them, amnestics and release. Some people are going to take you someplace safe, she said, putting a hand on Jerry's shoulder. Are you going to get, are you going to kill Mr. Greenberg? He asked. I was caught between the easy lie and the hard truth. Yes, she said. If we can. He seemed to think about this for a moment and then nodded. Good. She saw him into the helicopter and they 
then watched as he and the others were flown away. All that's, all that sets in place? She asked Jing. Yes, ma'am. Observers are currently watching Greenberg. So far, he's keeping to his schedule. We should expect him in two hours. So we wait, she said. He nodded. We do that a lot. We didn't. We didn't. Back in Omega-7, Ava will charge in, and it would all work out for him at least. She shivered. I prefer wait waiting. Mm. Beats dying, Jang said, her expression unreadable. She wondered if he practiced his poker face in the mirror. You, you ever take out a reality bender before? She asked. He nodded. Twice, a faint smile across his lips. Makes me an expert, just about. Well, let's try to make it three. It was just past midnight when a Rolls Royce approached the gates of the facility. The first assault happened about five feet in, as a concealed charge detonated under the car. The entire vehicle jumped nearly ten feet into the air, tumbling as it fell back to the ground, smoky pieces of wreckage falling off. It bounced before coming to a rest right side up. A broken, bleeding body slumped over the steering wheel. The rear left door opened, and a balding, greasy-looking man in a sweat-stained shirt and unwashed lab coat stepped out. A, no, a very professional-looking man, well-dressed, a researcher, a doctor. What is the meaning of this? He demanded. Iris made sure the flash was disabled and took a picture. There was still a whir as the camera released the photo. I was there. I saw it. You are interrupting the noble and virtual work of the foremost authority on the megaphysical phenomena of the world. Do you not understand it? the imprecautions even the slightest interruption has on my inquiries? Iris almost apologized to Dr. Greenberg, but she focused on developing the picture. Open fire, she said over to the radio. Guns flash and Greenberg's twitched several times as bullets hit the center of the of mass, but a moment later he was standing un unharmed. My internal damper slows the momentum of your bullets. My science is impeachable. She reached through the picture and tried something she'd been asked many times before. She had always refused before. She grabbed it at his head. So much smaller in the picture, and somehow much less handsome and respectable and intelligent looking. It tried to twist it. I know what the smell of this. I see how it is. Always trying to ruin me. You're like the rest. You ought to be locked away. He said, trying to resist her pull. He pulled out a piece of metal, and suddenly Iris's hand burned. Element 2 for 6 will block any telecaster abilities. The photo caught fire, and Iris had to drop it to the ground. Aha! There you are. Gunberg said, turning towards the fire. You thought you could win, but I am vicarious. He marched towards her. I am Joseph Greenberg. Did you think you could possibly beat me? Iris looked down at her feet. She wanted to just give up, go to one of, one of his cells. He was a better man, after all. But she gritted her, her teeth. I'll bet, she said. Nobody ever want to play with you in the playground, especially not cops and robbers. Are you knocking me? He said. Don't you know who I am? He shoved her in the chest, knocking her to the ground. He stood over her, hands on his hips, a sneer on his face. Yes, she said. And I know how you work. Now, take the shot. Take the shot. What are you talking about? Bruntly, his head and the part of his chest disappeared in a shower of red gore, gore staining the grass behind him. I wasn't talking to you, she said. Shaking slightly as she stood up. Asshole. Did it work? Adam's asked over the radio. It's not getting up, Iris said. But it probably worked. I don't think he'd shut up if, if he could still talk. And the body's been sent. And the body's been sent to the man's lab. He might be able to learn something useful through there. Through there wasn't much brain left. The college agent closed his notepad. That does it for a debrief. I try to leave him more 
wait next time. Adam said, please don't. He's much safer this way. Greensbury got man. Adam asked, take your pick. What's going to happen to the prisoners? Iris asked. Most of them aren't demonstrated any anomalous properties anymore. My best guess is that those are active manifestations. They will be debriefed, given am amnestics, and released with plausible cover stores. Enough money to start again if necessary. What about the boy? The agent looked down at the cover of his notepad, avoiding her eyes. Greenberg was unable to affect them. That's anomalous in itself. So, so one reality banner couldn't do anything to him? Maybe Greensburg had a hang-up about changing children. We administered pilot amnestics for a ride on site. We keep the subjects from finding their way back. They had no effect on him. Iris glared. Agent, at worst, he's unaffected by certain anomalies. That's the opposite of a threat to normalcy. Ma'am? The agent fidgeted. The thing is, he could be an important asset when dealing with exactly the kind of threat we saw tonight. Bullshit, he's ten. The GLC sent millions, spent millions of dollars and hundreds of hours to make Clef resistant to certain anomalies. This boy has it naturally. Can we just let him walk away? He's a child. Well, that's a decision for someone else to make. I can only make suggestions. He turned and walked away. Fucking weasel, Iris muttered. She packed her camera back in its case and latched it shut. Eh, at least he's on our side, Adam said. By the way, you said something back there about cats and robbers. What? Oh, Greenberg. He was reacting. He'd see what was hitting him, and then he'd have whatever science he needed to survive. You ever played Cats and Robbers as a kid? Um, and his expression was blank for a moment. I, not that I remember. Well, everyone points and says when they, when they shoot. You're supposed to stop when someone shoots you. But some kids won't do that. They insist the other kid, cause the other kid missed. Or they're very imaginative. They'll say they have a bulletproof vest or a force field. <laughs> Adam smiled. Or, Iris frowned. Or a clone. Adam stopped smiling. You don't think. I think. I think I want to go back to my room now. It's been a long night. 